Well, let, let's get, get started. Um, so again, welcome uh, to the first Ski Distinguished uh, Lecture for the Good. for this year. Excellent. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dario Gill. Let me start by apologizing because I'm absolutely certain I will not do justice to Dario's many roles and achievements in this introduction, but I'll try to highlight a few things. Uh, Dario is IBM's Senior Vice President and Director of Research. He leads the technology roadmap and the technical community of IBM directing innovation strategies in areas including hybrid cloud, AI, semiconductors, quantum computing, and exploratory science. Uh, he's a globally recognized leader in quantum computing. Uh, under his leadership, IBM was the first company in the world to build programmable quantum computers and make them universally available uh, through the cloud. Uh, Dario chairs the COVID-19 HPC Computing Consortium, which provides access to the world's most powerful high-performance computing resources in support of COVID-19 research, uh, supporting over 100 projects. It's had a tremendous impact uh, when we desperately needed that. Uh, he's also the thought leader behind initiatives such as the International Science Reserve and the National Strategic Computing Reserve. Uh, Actually, in my role at OSTP and NSF, I had the pleasure of working with Dario on some of these initiatives. Uh, it's been a real honor. Uh, Dario is a member of the National Science Board, uh, the governing body of the National Science Foundation, and serves uh, on the President's Research Council of the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research and the MIT School of Engineering Dean's Advisory Council. He also served on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, the PCAST, um, the, I, I think I'm going to stop there and turn it back to you, Dario. I could go on. So I'll hand it over to you. Welcome. And uh, we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, first, uh, let me say that it's a wonderful privilege to uh, be able to spend some time today uh, on, a, on a Friday afternoon to talk about science and computation and Manish more personally, uh, as you alluded, like, you know, some of those initiatives, we've had the opportunity to work so closely together, right? And, uh, and other leaders, and it's always been a pleasure to, uh, to work and interact with you and a lot more things to do. So let me begin by, uh, let me see if I can get um, here the material sharing. So hopefully that's working. Uh, let me see, there you go, okay. So I would like to be able to uh, share with you a perspective about the opportunity of bringing together um, the massive changes that are going on in the world of computing. And we, we will get a chance to talk uh, about them in some detail, but put them in the context of the opportunity we have them to bring them to bear to accelerate the process of discovery, to really enable to scale the scientific uh, method in terms of its reach and its scale and its power uh, to uh, previously unseen heights. But before I do that, just as a brief of means introduction, since it's so hard to travel uh, nowadays, I thought I would give you at least a visual uh, trip uh, to tell you where I'm speaking from right now. Uh, this is the global headquarters uh, of IBM Research. It's this beautiful building that was designed by Eero Sirenen uh, that opened in 1961. And uh, it's about 45 minutes north of, of New York City. And uh, so you can now picture, picture myself inside one of those windows uh, from, from where I'm talking. And it serves as, um, as a headquarters of a, of a network of research laboratories uh, that composes uh, IBM Research and, and that I have the privilege of leading. This is actually our 77th year that we've operated uh, IBM Research. And, um, you know, and over the history, there's been, I think, a, a wonderful track record uh, of, of very fundamental scientific uh, advancements that have led to you know, six IBMers winning Nobel Prizes and, uh, and you know, a broad array of contributions to the field of information technology and computation, but also to fields like uh, nanotechnology uh, and, and materials, and which we'll get a chance to talk about. And you know, a, a little bit more of, uh, of a visual picture. You see some of our other laboratories. We operate a wonderful laboratory also with MIT devoted to AI. You see our Almaden laboratory in California, 
Albany, which is our home to a lot of our semiconductor activities, the 300 millimeter research environment, the Zurich Laboratory and, and our Haifa Laboratory in, 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 uh, in Israel. But at the heart of it, the most important part of it is that what we do is to attract talented people, talented scientists and, and researchers and, and engineers. And we're about a community of about 3,000 uh, uh, researchers of, of a broad diversity of disciplines, mathematics and physical sciences and chemists, engineers, experts in artificial intelligence, in quantum, in cryptography. But what really binds us in common, these diverse communities that we're very focused about the future of, of information and the future of, of computation. And simply put, our, our, our desire is to discover what's next. And what I wanna share with you today is a perspective that what's next in computing is, uh, I like this sort of like, you know, simple summary is, is bits plus neurons plus qubits. Uh, you know, bits as an exemplar of uh, the digital world that we have built over the last many decades uh, of, you know, high precision calculations and reproducibility uh, of computation and communication. Neurons as an embodiment of the world of neural networks or artificial intelligence. And qubits, of course, uh, as you know, the fundamental unit uh, of computation of the world of quantum computing. And we're going to explore the implications of, of each one of these areas in relationship, as I mentioned, to scientific discovery, uh, but also give us an opportunity to see some of the major advances that are happening uh, as an example in the world of, of quantum. So I thought that, that it would be useful uh, to begin by putting in that context of the implications of this uh, computing revolution in, in the world of, of scientific discovery. And, and the reason for that is, you know, it goes without saying in, in, in an audience such as this one, is the fact that the complexity and the scale of the global challenges that we face today and that we will continue to face um, are a testament of the fact that the urgency of science has never been stronger than, than it is now. So whether we're dealing with the current pandemic or future ones or climate change or food and water shortages or energy security, what we really, you know, what these challenges demand is that we act with unprecedented agility and speed. And that, you know, frankly speaking, what we need to do is to accelerate the rate of discovery of solutions to our most pressing problems. And, and so it is in, in that light that, um, that I think we should be rooted methodologically, even when we're talking about computation, around the scientific method as our best uh, model for discovery. And uh, we all know it well about the aspect of asking questions, doing research and forming hypotheses, and then running experiments uh, to, to test it. And that during that whole process that we will delineate in an example in a minute, um, we systematically observe, measure, and replicate results and then if needed, we modify the hypothesis and repeat the process again and again and again. Now we know that this method works, uh, but we also know that the method is expensive and, and very often it takes us many years um, to be able to drive that discovery process. We also know that the approach uh, has been evolving, of course. So, uh, you know, science itself has been uh, evolving. And, and over the, the centuries now, we have seen a number of major paradigm shifts. I mean, from empirical science, all about observing nature and measuring to theoretical science, where um, you know, researchers would come up with hypotheses, I mean, with theories and use observations to uh, validate or refute these hypotheses. About, you know, in the advent of the 1950s, of course, with the introduction of, of computers, um, we've seen the, the, the traditional scientific method get a boost. And we've also seen that continuous advances in high performance computing um, have enabling the world of modeling and simulation, for example, of complex molecules, allowing us to accelerate the cycles of hypothesis and testing um, to what, you know, over the last 15 years or so, we've, we've named also sort of big data driven science. Um, but even with these advances, it, it is worth recognizing that still the scientific method is, you know, it's slow, it's a slow process. And then we need to accelerate it given the nature of the, the problems that, that we're confronting. And here's where we have a new opportunity and as an example where the world of AI enters um, because of the possibilities of providing us unprecedented levels of speed and automation and scale, uh, which helps us actually address more, more complex problems. So that's why 
you know, um, we really believe, and this is like, you know, across the scientific community, there's so much excitement uh, around how AI, um, you know, can help us usher uh, a new era of accelerated discovery. And it can do that by helping us uh, turn, you know, what often is a linear process to something a little bit closer as we increase the level of automation to a, to a closed loop. And, and what do I mean by that? So imagine that uh, we want to create a new plastic, for example, with very specific properties, um, you know, extremely flexible, but also lightweight um, and able to uh, fall apart into its original uh, monomers for recycling. So first, uh, we have to outline these desired properties. And then uh, I'm going to show you very concretely in a minute uh, with some, some examples around you know, using AI itself and natural language processing to be able to sift through existing knowledge of uh, the polymer manufacturing to see the previous research and patents and fabrication attempts and form a knowledge base. And the next step is to use you know, high-performance computers or in the future, we'll talk about quantum computers, to be able to help us conduct simulations to augment that knowledge base um, that we started with. And then, for example, the ability to use generative models in AI to identify knowledge gaps that may be present in that base knowledge and simulations we've created. And then from there, uh, being able to drive uh, with robotic automation uh, and robotic laboratories, for example, guiding the experimental process in its own right, and then iterating that. And uh, we're going to you know, show this uh, working in practice uh, to be able to bring it to light, what sounds uh, a little bit abstract now for, for a second. So the reason that, you know, uh, laying out like this, we have an opportunity to realize this accelerated vision is because we actually have, uh, you know, a really powerful set of technologies uh, that we can bring to bear. Supercomputers, you know, quantum computers, AI systems, and tying it all together, uh, a hybrid cloud platform, a hybrid cloud architecture that allows you, that allows us to compose uh, the best of the best of these systems. So um, we talked about, you know, briefly, like that we're going to bring these technologies together. So let's see it in let's see it in practice. And I thought that it would be best to do it through through a concrete example. And um, and let's consider the world of chemistry uh, for a minute. We know that you know the it's vital for manufacturing, for medicine, for anything where we need to create new materials. And it's also crucial to develop technology that you know is also sustainable uh, as we do that. And let's take the example of semiconductors, right? As an example, it's a field in which we're very active. It's also top of mind, I think, for uh, everybody, including politicians right now that you know, are keenly understand that it is embedded in every product that we made, and including automotives. And uh, they are you know, around our phones and watches and cars and homes. And as an example, we need to ensure that uh, not only their energy consumption of these semiconductors are sustainable, but also the materials and processes that we use to build them are sustainable as well. So we've, um, you know, uh, engaged in, you know, a very systematic effort to develop sustainable materials for microelectronics uh, while maintaining and improving performance. And um, one example of a material that is crucial is today, you know, these, these chips are uh, manufactured uh, using UV light and, you know, and, and also EUV light to create, a, as, as many of you know, a 3D pattern in a photosensitive material called a photoresist that is uh, essential to be able to enable the planar process to work. And that the pattern defines the transistors and the interconnect wires that we use to scale, to scale our chips. Now, early photoresist um, used the incoming light, incoming light to do chemistry directly by creating or breaking uh, chemical bonds. And um, in the 1980s, um, uh, researchers at IBM, actually like you know, Ito and Frechette and uh, Grant Wilson, invented a, a new process, uh, the chemically amplified photoresist, and which used for the first time a catalytic process in semiconductor patterning. And what, what happened as a result of this is that it increased dramatically the resolution and the detail that could be printed. And a key component in creating this chemically amplified photoresist is the photoacid generator. It's called a PAG. And um, it's this uh, photoresist that you know, harness the, the light to translate a 2D optical image into a 3D uh, pattern. And, and you know, this has been a, you know, was a crucial uh, innovation that has been broadly recognized in the industry. Um, but one of the challenges that it has is to um, 
to make it more sustainable in the materials that gets used. So, so now that you have that context, the reality of it is like, let's say we're gonna go and design a new generation photoresist or you know, using a new, new class of packs. And now we confront the challenge that typically it takes about 10 years to go from discovery of a new material to bring it to market. And the cost of developing this process could be anywhere between 10 and $100 million, right? So, you know, that's a, as an example, it took about 10 years from the beginning of research in the discovery and first use of nylon, uh, you know, in a, in, a tooth, in a toothbrush, right? Just to give a, a totally different example. So the, the task we give ourselves is how can we bring these advances in computing and in technology to accelerate the process by a factor of 10x? So let's look at um, this process. Um, of how now the individual components, now we're gonna go into more detail, um, can help us accelerate this loop. And then we're gonna see it in the context of being applied to a, a concrete material, which is gonna be these photo acid generators that get used in, uh, in photoresist for semiconductor manufacturing. So um, let's break it down into components of the materials discovery workflow and each with its own acceleration factor. So first of all, um, we're going to bring in AI software, uh, you know, a tool that uh, we call Deep Search, to uh, sift through existing literature. So using Deep Search typically speeds up the process by about a thousand times, as the uh, AI uh, environment can ingest and process about 20 pages per second per processing core. Whereas, as we obviously know, human readers, uh, you know, need about like one to two minutes per page, right? I mean, best case scenario. Um, the second element of it, uh, AI enriched simulation, uh, has led to about, you know, twice as fast screening of experimental parameters in some cases, and up to a 40 times faster in others. So this is about using AI to guide the simulation process. Um, the third element of using generative models um, to help us fill the gaps. We've seen about a 10x uh, acceleration using these models to fill in gaps and create material concepts for tests. And finally, uh, the, you know, to test the results in an AI-driven uh, laboratory um, also shows us that compared to historical synthetic efforts with, um, for example, the typical retrosynthetic prediction shows about 100x faster synthesis uh, using these robotic labs. So let's see it in practice, right? This is a little bit of a summary of the advances. So we're gonna use, as I mentioned before, uh, this flow and this process to help us design and synthesize a new PAG, uh, you know, a, a new photo acid generator. So, um, so let's begin with that process, right? Scientists would search the published literature and uh, use what they could find, plus their own knowledge and expertise to design a molecule and target the properties needed. Um, then we will go through the process of uh, iterative cycles of synthesis, characterization, and testing until we get the, um, the, right, the right compound. So, so what you're looking here um, is the chemical space represented uh, representation for these packs. Every dot represents a single molecule, and they're grouped in color clusters where each color um, indicates distinct classes or families of packs. Another way to represent this information is using a circular dendrogram where the PAX families are sorted into these uh, phylogenic trees by chemical similarity that you're seeing depicted on the right-hand side. So first, now we're gonna use a deep search capability as we go and design this effort. So um, the AI system here is collecting what is known about PAX. Uh, in general, the amount of documented knowledge is, is, we know is too large and growing too fast to be handled by humans. So to put it in perspective, just in you know, scientific literature in like, you know, just a few years ago alone in 2018, there were more than 2 million papers uh, that were published. So here, the technology we're using is something called the IBM Corpus Conversion Service, allows us to convert PDFs of uh, the published you know, scientific papers into and then incorporate, incorporate uh, the elements into a knowledge graph that allows us to explore the policy and search the knowledge and extract the data. So um, 
it, the knowledge graph that is produced can be queried in a you know, kind of time to solution of about 100 milliseconds uh, for queries that have you know, about five edges of, of connecting between areas in a kind of 64 million uh, edge graph. So for example, the corpus conversion service can ingest the full PAG corpus, so all the publications that we could find um, uh, of about 60,000 pages in, uh, in less than an hour, um, you know, in a reasonable server size. And the information is then organized in a knowledge graph that has, in this case, 2.2. Okay. All right. So, so now what we're going to do here is like look at the dendrogram where the PAX families are sorted by chemical similarity, right? That you're seeing on the right. But notice all the empty space around the outside of the ring. That's because there's important data on properties of PAGs for most of the you know, uh, compounds of interest that was absent from the literature, right? So for some properties, the available data is so sparse or noisy or unreliable that it's actually almost useless. In other cases, uh, the specific properties that we are using are not normally reported in a publication or, or a patent. So we have to augment this data set with enough data on predictive properties to train the AI model. So here we've used an AI enriched simulations to provide quantitative values for important properties for the PAGs in the data set. So purple shows the computed values for one property associated with toxicity. This is what's labeled here as LD50 in these known PAG families. Blue shows the computed values for another property uh, associated with environmental persistence, you know, the biodegradability of, uh, of the material. So now those first two rings, LD50 and biodegradability, were calculated um, you know, using this data-driven model to, to get these uh, you know, uh, physiochemical properties uh, for this material set. Okay, the outer ring now with the green data shows the computed value for another property that is key to the design of this material, which is lambda max, which is the wavelength at which the material has its strongest absorption. And this, for example, to give an example, this property is calculated using very expensive time-dependent density functional theory methods uh, to compute the UV absorption of the pack uh, cations. So, so this is an approximate first principle model. And in the future, we'll talk in a minute, uh, could be replaced by quantum mechanical, quantum computing simulations. But we'll learn more about that in a, in a second. So we want to encapsulate the entire predictive simulation uh, you know, environment and containerize also the software infrastructure in order to be able to run it and reproduce it anywhere. So that's another thing in terms of the core infrastructure. But you've seen like now uh, two steps of this process. So let's go to the next one. So once we have uh, the resulting, the resulted augmented data set, so we've taken literature and patent data, now completed the gaps through this AI guided simulation. And now with these bases, we're going to build an AI model to uh, predict thousands of potential packs that have better sustainability attributes. So you can see now uh, some of the output of the generative model, um, how it fits into the pack design space of the dendrogram. The white elements of the inner ring are novel photoacid generated structures that were entirely created by the AI generative model. So let's stay back because I'm using that word generative model a moment to take a, a, a closer look uh, at what's happening with generative models. And the, the key aspect is we're using now these large neural networks, not just as a you know, classifier, but also as a source of generation of new content. So in the traditional approach of using large scale neural networks, um, these discriminative models just classify the data. And we know that neural networks and deep learning have brought you know, important new capabilities uh, 
uh, for tasks that require discrimination, like image recognition and natural language processing and speech transcription. But generative models are going beyond discrimination, right? They're, they're really starting to produce really impressive results at scale. And the fundamental difference is we're using these models to create, not to classify. So as an example, and you may have heard it in a totally different domain, that deep generative models were used to create the first AI-generated portrait that was sold at Christie's, right, in, the, uh, in 2018. But also you've heard it in the context of being used to create extremely realistic faces of people that don't exist, right? So this is like the, the world of deep fakes that you know, has you know, interesting opportunities, a lot of controversy. We've seen also uh, pre-trained transformers combined with deep generative models used to automatically generate natural language text, right? You give a short prompt and it generates a, essentially an essay around it. So you know, famously GPT-3 is an example of that where with one sentence, you can generate two to 500 word essay that you know actually sometimes can look extremely compelling and realistic. But what interests us here in the context I'm sharing with you is the world of chemistry, where the design and the discovery of new molecules is faced also with a chemical space that is infinitely uh, fast. So, so the idea was to adapt these techniques uh, and, and what we're seeing with generative models is that whether you're talking about molecules to creating stories and arguments and even images of peoples and places and objects that never existed, uh, or even generated code, you know, code is a language in its own right and generative models as a means to be able to create the next generation of software is going to be incredibly important. So they really can provide us with a very powerful new tool to search for candidate materials and generate hypotheses that expand uh, both the discovery space and the creativity of, of scientists. So used in material design, AI generative models learn to represent materials, uh, data, to generate a hypothesis based on the data that was extracted and augmented, as I showed before. And then it provides a representation that AI architectures that are not specialized in materials. That's what's very interesting, right? You're using the, the general form of representations that we're using in NLP and other areas to be able to now apply to the, to the domain of materials. So with that little bit of a side discussion on generative models, let's go back to PAGs, right? To our material example that we're doing. So after applying the generative model to fill in the gaps and rapidly, you know, and we generated about a thousand uh, PAG candidates with the generative models, that had the targeted absorption wavelength and solubility, we turn now to the last element of it, which is sort of the expert in the loop uh, process to use the knowledge of the subject matter expert, in this case, the material scientist, to select the best candidates that may be suitable for experimental validation. The spikes highlighted here in, uh, in this slide indicate molecules and properties that were either directly prioritized by a human expert or highlighted based on an AI model trained by that expert. So to train that AI model, the human expert evaluates hundreds of candidate materials with a simple criteria like interesting, not interesting, or feasible, not feasible. And this adjudication is used to train a simple AI classifier. And look, this is not perfect, but that's okay because we're just using it to prioritize the subsequent uh, examples uh, for human review. So then we took one of those materials forward for the next step, uh, synthesizing the compound to validate its sustainability qualities and performance. And synthesis is the most demanding task in making materials and requires very substantial human effort. Um, but one of the recent uh, inventions and advances we've been driving in the last few years is a cloud-based AI-driven autonomous lab called IBM RxN for chemistry and IBM RoboRxN. And uh, you can find these online and you can you know, uh, try them out uh, directly on your own. And, um, and we use these tools to design the best synthetic routes and implement them remotely in a robotic laboratory that is connected to, to this software. So here, here's a short video of IBM RoboRxN at work. It is synthesizing PAGs um, of a class that was down selected from the generative model output. The, you know, some of those examples I was just showing you before. 
And this new chemistry lab leverages, um, you know, AI and automation to be able to accelerate this, this process of, of synthesis. And, and what we've shown here that's been very interesting is how a purely digital experience can be connected to the creation of um, the physical molecule. And it really is an enhancer of, of productivity uh, through this process. By the way, the generative model that we use wasn't only to be able to generate the um, new uh, PAG examples with the desired properties, but we also use generative models to directly create the recipe that was fed into the robotic laboratory. So the sort of like that step-by-step -step process was also created with a generative model and sent to the robotic lab automation for, for uh, action. And that's how we achieve the first material in our loop uh, using accelerated discovery. And uh, here what you see is the measure mass uh, spectrum. You know, in astronomy, the, the first light, uh, the first picture taken by a new telescope might not be, you know, scientifically the most important, but it really shows that the whole telescope works and uh, it brings on the promise of discoveries to come. And, you know, the same is true in particle physics with the first collisions, right, in a first particle accelerator. And here what we have achieved is the first material where we took deep search form um, from, uh, you know, the complete knowledge of what was known around PAGs using AI and rich simulation augmented um, with now data that was important for sustainability and performance property in terms of absorption. The generative model uh, created the proposed uh, potential new candidates with the targeted properties. And then the expert in the loop technologies helped prioritize the candidates. And finally, the autonomous lab designed and executed the correct synthetic procedure to produce a targeted pack. And uh, it's the first pack material from the whole loop. And um, you know, it brings the promise of, you know, of many, many more accelerated discoveries to, to come. Now, as, as powerful as the methodology is and using all the techniques that we have available today, we also know from an information theory perspective and um, from a you know, theoretical perspective that we can divide the nature of problems that we can tackle with computation between easy problem and hard problems. And we know that uh, there are many classes of hard problems that no matter how advanced classical computing continues to, to progress, the best we're going to be able to do is to approximate some of those solutions. We also know that there is you know, a new information theoretical construct and a new technology called quantum computing that alters the equation uh, between what's possible and impossible to solve. That doesn't mean that all the problems that are known to be hard are going to be addressable by quantum computing, but that we do know that important problems that we care deeply about, like simulating quantum mechanical processes as an example, which impact modeling nature and, um, and even problems uh, that have to do with other data with structure like factoring that has important implications for cryptography and security, that are going to be altered as a consequence of uh, reformulating the you know, information theory basis of our modern world of computation. And in fact, this new technology that we're now going to briefly discuss and bring into bear into this process is the first time, actually, that the category of computing with a capital C is branching. And that you know, it's, it's actually not quite correct to basically take uh, you know, the famous plot that, uh, that we've all seen in, in, you know, in the past of seeing like, you know, the performance or the cost uh, of processing a bit of information as a function of time and how we've had many different technology generations that you know, in the last 60 years, which popularly known as Moore's Law, um, you know, has driven this exponential increase uh, in terms of the level of performance. And that you know, what we're really seeing here is we should not understand quantum as just like another step on Moore's law, but rather a departure from it, like a different, you know, branch of it. And in the future, we will continue to advance classical computing, but now we have a different vector. And moving forward, we will have to refer to computing as either classical or quantum. And that's how fundamental the change that is being driven and the implications you'll have to our fields. So let's unpack uh, why is this fundamental? What is different about it than classical computing? 
And uh, where are we on the technology field and what will be its relationship to this process of discovery and scientific discovery? So let's begin by uh, looking into the anatomy, just to give you an intuition uh, into the anatomy of a quantum algorithm. So, um, you know, let's represent it uh, for, for now uh, as this information realm as a sphere, okay? And in the um, sphere, let's say in the classical uh, world of, of bits, uh, we get to represent in our sphere uh, information by either placing things in the North Pole, let's call that a zero, or in the South Pole, let's call that a one. Now, in quantum computing, the first trick that we're able to do um, is we create a superposition of all the states that are available to us as a function of the number of qubits that we have available in our machine. So, you know, if you have... Just representing them with those pink dots. Uh, but in fact, let's imagine those dots not as dots, but as little moons, okay, that are in my sphere, right? So first we're creating this superposition. So now we can no longer have to put or state into the North Pole or the South Pole. We can put them, you know, in the equator and we can imagine them also in any kind of point in the surface of that sphere. The next thing we do in our quantum system is we inject the data into the system we want to compute over. So in this case, we're encoding the problem in the states that we have available in our sphere. So, so here, uh, as an example of that, uh, remember I told you to imagine them as little moons, right? So instead of like those little pink dots, imagine them as little spheres on their own right. So here, the injection of the data into the states could mean a rotation of the moon. So here, we're encoding the data in the phase of the states that are present in my system. So the final step here um, is now we take these states, define each one by an amplitude and a phase, and the phase has an encoding of the data from the outside world. And quantum computing is the process of taking those states and interfering them with one another through a sequence of well-controlled steps in such a manner that the right answer gets maximized through constructive interference. And the answers we don't care about get minimized through the process of destructive interference in such a way that in the end, we can perform a measurement in our system and reveal the answer we care about. I say this because it is so fundamentally different than representing information with a binary state and using transistors and, you know, and a voltage to allow a current to go on and off to be able to produce Boolean logic, right? So with that sort of like, you know, a little bit of a high level abstraction of it, um, let's compare it now, the technology and see where we are. And in some ways, uh, the last five, six years are reminiscent of the situation we found ourselves in the 1940s and 50s. You know, this is a wonderful picture in the uh, mid 40s of uh, showing what it felt like to run a program in a computer uh, at the time. And, um, you know, six years ago, seven years ago, um, even the few laboratories that were able to produce a few working qubits to be able to perform a calculation, uh, really running a program looked like that. That's a picture of Jerry Chow in our laboratory, one of our laboratories here in Yorktown, uh, quite literally, you know, tuning the microwave pulses that go into the machine to be able to perform a computation. But um, you know, the field has dramatically changed in the last uh, six years or so. And you know, in May 2016, uh, Manish was mentioning in the introduction, uh, we you know, were the first company to put a small quantum computer, have five qubits, and make it universally available through, through the cloud. And, and now there was no more of this business of like sitting in front of uh, you know of the dials to send the microwave pulses, you could just sit in front of any computer all over the world, and be able to put in your uh, quantum gates around it and click run, and um, and then this system would run uh, behind the scenes. And it's been a wonderful success. You know there are many systems we built over time, and you know over seven hundred scientific publications now 
using the uh, you know 27 plus quantum computers that we've built and deployed. And at any given day, you know, just to give you a flavor, three and a half billion quantum circuits are run every day uh, on uh, on IBM's quantum computers that we have online. Um, in our case, we use superconducting uh, quantum computers. There's different ways to build quantum computers. You could use ion traps, uh, et cetera. In our case, we use superconducting technology. We use um, you know, the, the core device. It's called a transmon qubit that we utilize. You're seeing here a model of, uh, of one of our quantum systems that look like these beautiful golden chandeliers. And uh, those are the superconducting uh, coaxial cables that allows us to send microwave pulses all the way down. And at the very bottom of the cryostat, it operates about 15 millikelvin, right? So one of, one of the coldest places in the universe is the bottom of these quantum computers. So this is the environment we created. Uh, you sit in your terminal, uh, you write your program. We send the zeros and ones uh, of your classical program over the internet. When they come to the system, we convert them to microwave pulses that operate about five gigahertz. We send the microwave pulses down the cryostat to the coaxial cables. Um, through these coupling resonators, we create the superposition, entanglement, and interfering states that I gave you an intuition for a minute ago. We perform the computation. We take the, the signal out. We amplify it through the cryostat. We convert it back to uh, zeros and ones, and we return the answer to the user. And uh, this is a little bit of zoom in, so you see what is inside the cryostats. You see here the coaxial cables, the shiny little square at the bottom, that's a quantum processor um, that, uh, that sits there in terms of, of the quantum chip that we designed and built here in the laboratory where I sit. And, um, and then you're seeing all the sort of like the different components in terms of uh, amplifiers and attenuators and, um, and as well as the cryogenic elements to be able to make all of that work. This is, um, so since, you know, now you're you're seeing here uh, the growth of a global quantum community, and and what you're seeing here is the users, just a snapshot of the users over the last five six years. Where we've seen is an exponential growth in this community uh, of users. So over a trillion quantum circuits now have been run, and um, and and also interestingly, you see when there was a crossover point a few years back between providing an environment of simulation versus providing an environment of actual quantum hardware. Um, now there's a global ecosystem uh, uh, of this quantum community and quantum industry. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we have you know, well over 20 uh, quantum computers deployed right now, available online, as well as now you know, physical instantiation of these environments with our partners in Germany, in Fraunhofer, University of Tokyo in Japan, um, you know, uh, soon with the Cleveland Clinic in Korea. And of course, we've done many in the, in the United States as well. So I want to show you where it's going, uh, you know, what, what to expect in the next few years and, um, and kind of like the rate of progress that, that is happening, right? I mean, our, our vision for the future of quantum computing is to create a frictionless experience where you don't have to be a quantum theorist or no quantum mechanics to take advantage of, of quantum computers. So our vision is that you're going to sit in front of your favorite programming language, right? Um, you know, uh, let's say it's in Python, you're going to, behind the scenes, there's going to be libraries uh, of, uh, that are embedded in functions. Uh, those libraries are going to map into quantum circuits. These quantum circuits will be executed in the right quantum computer in a cloud-based environment and sort of like transparently return the answer back to you in an embedded uh, software environment that will allow you to uh, benefit from the computations that quantum computing can do extraordinarily well, but without having to know any aspect of uh, quantum mechanics. So these quantum circuits is, are essential because they are the representation uh, that quantum computers use to be able to exploit their inherent advantage. And the pursuit of quantum advantage that we believe is gonna be possible to be realized in the next couple of years will be the moment where we can solve problems either cheaper or faster or more accurately than classical computing. And there's kind of like three broad categories where we envision having the biggest impact. One is the original idea, right? That was professed by Richard Feynman and others uh, way back which is simulating nature, right? Modeling the natural world, problems that matters with 
you know, uh, in physics and chemistry and material science. The second one is uh, data that has structure uh, within it. So this will have implications for areas like machine learning. It's a burgeoning new field. Um, this idea of using, you know, quantum for machine learning is very exciting. But also, you know, things like ranking in groups or factoring, right? The famous Shor algorithm. And then there will be, you know, quantum computing. It's a universal form of computing. You can use it for any problem. Um, but there are, you know, there'll be class of problems where you achieve a non-exponential speed up. So for example, sampling and Monte Carlo, uh, optimization problems. So in the future, when we have sufficiently large systems, it may be that we provide polynomial speed ups um, that are still valuable, uh, but not exponential in, in nature. So as a consequence of this uh, uh, array of, of applications, we are seeing now uh, the growth of a new industry and you're seeing here you know we now have over 170 to 174 institutions to be precise that work with us on this and you're seeing on the right hand side examples of applications that are broad range of companies including from financial companies like jp morgan to energy companies like exxon to aerospace like boeing um, to you know uh, research institutions like the army uh, air force research laboratory and cleveland clinic and you know uh, industrial partners like Daimler, you know, broad array uh, of interest in, in this space. So to realize this quantum advantage, progress in the field is going to have to follow three vectors. The scale of the systems we can create. So how big a machine can you build? Uh, the quality of it. How well does the machine obey quantum mechanics? What's the error rate that is present in the qubit? What's the level of coherence that is present in this system? This, you know, if you integrate many of these functions together, is what we refer to as quantum volume. And then third is speed. The reality is any application is going to re re require the execution of hundreds of thousands, millions, even billions of circuits being run iteratively to get to an answer. So the speed at which we can execute these quantum circuits is fundamentally important to be able to deliver value around that. So scale, quality, and speed are the elements around that. So let me briefly touch on, on each to see what's happening. So scale, where are we? So you're seeing in 2010, the example of one of the qubits that we would make here in Yorktown. You see now what a quantum processor looks like, right? You know, fully integrated package uh, process that includes technology like superconducting through silicon vias, right? And so on, right? Like very sophisticated now, uh, process of fabrication and packaging that incorporates decades of knowledge also of traditional semiconductor technology. So if you want to see where we are right now and where we're going in terms of scale, I'll highlight, like we released earlier this year, the IBM Quantum Roadmap, I'll highlight for the moment the bottom row. So the bottom row uh, shows you the scale of the system just a few months ago in November. We announced the first quantum processor in the world that broke the 100 qubit barrier. Specifically, it's a 127 qubit machine. Uh, this year, in 2022, we will build a 433 qubit machine. And next year, we will build the first machine with over 1,000 qubits, 1,121 uh, to be exact. And the important aspect of all of this is that we've made massive advancements to make the technology scalable. So the reason it is important, the demonstration also of Eagle, the 127 qubit system, is because we brought a lot of technologies that allows us to scale the processor now to much larger ones. You're seeing here a rendering now that, you know, now we've gone into 3D, right? So long are the days of where you just have the qubits in a single plane and you're connecting them in that fashion. So now both the, you know, input signals, connectivity and so on are broken into different planes, not unlike in traditional semiconductors when we have you know, very sophisticated back end of the line, right? With multi-layer wiring and so on to enable these things uh, to occur. So we see clearly a path that gave you quantitative numbers and the scale of systems that are gonna be possible. Let me touch, briefly touch on, on the second dimension on quality, right? Errors are present in computation. They're particularly present in quantum machines. And, um, and perhaps one of the most important uh, metrics around that is the uh, two qubit uh, gate fidelity around it so uh what we demonstrated this year so i'll show you this is my favorite plot in quantum computing um it shows the error rate on the y-axis as a function of time starting in june 2017 to their present 
I'm gonna, you know, of course, notice this is in a log plot, so it's an exponential improvement. So please note the rate of progress. Every dot here is an experimental system that we have built, okay? So notice here that um, this year, uh, we've achieved an error rate in, uh, you know, in devices, the first demonstrations of 10 to the minus three. So 99.9 .9 fidelity, right? So um, it's about an error in 10, and one error in 1,000. So if you just look at the plot of progress without knowing anything about the field and you just extrapolate, within the next two years, we have high confidence we will be able to achieve error rates of maybe one, one in 10,000, right? 10 to the minus four. That's gonna be a very important inflection point. I'll also note that we've achieved coherence times that now are in the hundreds of microseconds, you know, very close to approaching a millisecond, right? So the combination of high coherence times and lower rates is gonna be an important moment for the field in being able to demonstrate quantum advantage. And finally, speed, right? This year we demonstrated also that we have delivered 120x performance improvement in the speed of execution of this iterative process of executing circuits. So for example, a few years ago, the team was on the cover of Nature with the largest molecule that had been simulated with a quantum computer. So that process of, of uh, calculating the energy dissociation curve of lithium hydride has been improved by 120x, right? So the practicality of solving larger problems, it's also another area where there's massive advancements. We're also now laying out a vision of bringing this all together to frankly speaking, will will be the first generation of quantum centric supercomputers. We've seen in the past CPU centric supercomputers. We've seen GPU centric or AI centric supercomputers. And is like, you know, our thesis that we're going to see also QPU centric supercomputers, right? That are going to combine with classical machines. And so we've also released um, the design of our next generation system that we are going to be building. Uh, called IBM Quantum System 2, designed also not only to scale to quantum processors with thousands and tens of thousands and even millions of qubits, but also to allow an environment of interconnectivity between quantum computers, perhaps first, of course, through embarrassingly parallel applications, and in the future by having coherent links that are entangled between quantum processors as well. And that's where we will see the fields of quantum communication and computing combined right, first to a quantum intranet and in the future with a quantum internet as well. So extremely exciting, you know, advances are happening in the field. So you're seeing here the concept of a quantum data center um, that we are, um, you know, designing, developing and, and implementing. So let me wrap it up and, um, and bring it back together to the original thesis that I laid out, that we are witnessing a revolution in computing. That simply put, this revolution is going to be this idea of bits, neurons, and qubits, right? Um, high precision computation, neural network based uh, systems combined with uh, quantum systems. And that even though each one of those fields continues to advance on its own right, and each one has massive power on its own right, I don't think the world has fully grasped yet the implications of their convergence. And the convergence of these areas needs to be integrated through a distributed computing environment, a hybrid cloud infrastructure. And on top of it, enabled and assisted by AI in its own right, AI assisted programming to mask the complexity of the heterogeneous environments underneath. And that perhaps is no more exciting application to these advances than to accelerate the scientific process of discovery on its own right. And if you look at the impact that accelerating discovery can have in industry. It is simply massive. Whether we're talking about industries that rely on discovery as a business, like the chemical industry or materials of life sciences, or businesses that rely on discovery, right? To make advances, like think about, you know, the automotive sector as an example and the advances that better batteries can have to electrification, just to give an obvious one as well as information and discovery-based enterprises with the process of discovery of you know, new customer preferences, right? Or new products to be able to advertise and create or retail are fundamental importance. So the good news is that our own disciplines in the scientific process is more vital than ever. And we also you know, advocate very strongly that it's time to reinvest in science and discovery because we really have no time to waste. 
So if you want to see a companion, you know, summary of some of these ideas as well, I'll point you to research.ibm.com, where we also posted um, uh, last year a science and technology outlook entirely devoted to this idea of accelerated discovery enabled by these uh, changes in computation. Thank you uh, for your time, and I look forward to uh, your questions and dialogue. Thank you, uh, Dari, for an absolutely brilliant and visionary talk. Uh, so why don't you give